As the fight for workers intensifies, employers are seeking out new ways to entice you in. Plus, the call to reform how Kansas handles out-of-state deadbeat parents. But first, what some call an epidemic of domestic violence and the price you're paying for it. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm your host, Pilar Pedraza. Kansas has a domestic violence program in danger, problem endangering lives and increasing violence, especially in the larger metro areas. The KBI this week released its annual report on domestic violence, stalking, and rape. It shows that in 2020, on average, Kansans reported one DV murder about every 10 days, one DV incident every 22 minutes and law enforcement made a domestic violence related arrest every 47 minutes. And it's not just statewide. This week, I took a deep dive into the issues here in Sedgwick County and the city of Wichita and what some say is behind the, at least part of the problem. It's a scene we've witnessed in increasing numbers over the last year or so. I'd like for you to get off the bed. Standoffs, murder, suicides, officer involved shootings like this one from earlier this month. Scenes experts say can often be prevented, but a recent study of Sedgwick County and the city of Wichita requested by the Wichita Police Department determined the city could do better, saying a state certified counseling program isn't, quote, consistently ordered by the courts. He ended up just snapping one night that I came back and just attacked me. I asked a couple of questions apparently that he didn't like. A recent survivor of domestic violence in Wichita, Stevie asked us to hide her identity. She's never even heard of what's called BIP or Batter Intervention Program Assessments. I think, oh my goodness, really, Wichita's not there. Huh. And we're pretty big city in Kansas, so that's kind of shocking. This study from the Council of State Governments found Sedgwick County has almost twice the rate of domestic violence incidents as the rest of the state and accounts for about a third of the total statewide, a quarter of the arrests and homicides. The study says in part it's because the Wichita Municipal Courts often use anger management training instead of BIP or a shortened form of BIP counseling. We all would love for a battery intervention program to be like a, a, a an afternoon class, right? Or a, you know, an online course. And I'm able to identify and repair any damage. Steve Halley and his wife, Dorothy Stuckey Halley, provide BIP assessments, counseling, and training in Topeka. So Dorothy helped develop that. the BIP counseling concept so. in Kansas. We have people from Topeka driving to Wichita for the one day Saturday event so that they can try to get relief from that. And we can't do anything to stop that from happening. The Halleys say time makes a difference, which is why the state certified programs run at least six months. And they were more interested in being efficient with a high caseload. Let's move people in and out. Uh, let's make this quick. Let's make it less expensive for the court system. Kurt Brungart and his wife Christy lost their daughter to domestic violence. In July of 2008, uh, our daughter Jana um, was a law student at the University of Kansas and she was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. And worked hard to get that state BIP law passed in 2012 in her honor. They were also chairs of the State Batterers Intervention Advisory Board in Kansas for five years and spent a lot of time working with the Wichita court system. It became obvious to me through many discussions that they didn't want to be involved in these long certified programs. Legislative records show back in 2012, a Wichita City Court judge who's still on the municipal bench today was one of three people to tell lawmakers this was a bad idea. For larger cities like Wichita, because of the time and cost involved. The end result is I'm convinced uh, that women in Wichita are not as safe. Over the last month, we've requested several times to speak with somebody on camera from the city courts by cell phone, text, and email. We haven't been able to make that happen yet, though they say they're working on it. In the meantime, we've had several off-camera conversations. They told me the folks behind the study only asked the municipal court to participate at the last minute, and most of the information refers to the county district court. 
And the Wichita court says as of September 2021, 89% of those convicted of domestic violence battery were referred for BIP assessment. So that's a start, domestic battery. But what we know is that so many domestic batteries are knocked down to simple battery. Both the Halleys and the Brungart say there are a lot of other domestic violence crimes against people and property that should be included in the assessment statistics. Dorothy adds Kansas has already come a long way from where it was when BIP counseling began and is now a national leader in handling domestic violence cases. We certainly aren't where we need to be in every community, but it's amazing that in this state we've been able to get this far. But is it far enough for folks like Stevie, who's still recovering from a traumatic brain injury suffered in a domestic attack? Some severe memory loss might sense of direction is all backwards. If something had, like this had been in place, had been offered to you and your Years partners, ago, would it have made a difference? Yes, absolutely. And joining me to tackle this life and death issue, we have State Senator Aletha Fausto, a Democrat from Republican, and the Assistant Senate Minority Leader. And we have State Senator Rick Wilborn, a Republican from McPherson, and the Senate Vice President. Thank you both so much for joining us today. A very important issue, but also an extremely complex one that I know both of you guys have been involved with. I know Aletha, you have had several bills recently that you've introduced along these topics, working, I believe, with uh, Judge Phil Journey. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first, uh, uh, Pilar, thank you so much for having me, having us. Um, yeah, uh, when I first went into the Kansas Senate in 2009, I introduced uh, uh, a domestic violence bill along with um, uh, Judge Phil Journey, who was a senator at that time. Um, and we have inched away at trying to address this uh, sometimes deadly issue. Uh, especially here in Cedric County, Wichita. Um, uh, the Senator Whit Rick here, actually um, legislation that Senator Dinah Sykes and I introduced to help those who had to um, break a, a lease to move to safety. Um, uh, that bill did pass. You gave us a hearing on that bill. I actually introduced another bill to uh, require that on the first time that one goes before the court, that instead of anger management classes, they would go directly to the batterers uh, intervention program. I've been recently uh, appointed by um, uh, Attorney General Derek Smith to serve on a statewide uh, board to um, address domestic violence. Um, I, I'm hopeful that that uh, large committee will really address the issue. But I want to say this, um, during the uh, first part of the pandemic, and we were getting the um, uh, checks uh, from the federal level to help us out, um, I found out from Catholic, Catholic charities that um, the women that had to go into a uh, safe house, like the family crisis, uh, to get away from their abuser, um, that they did not get their part of the money. Let's say that they were married and they filed jointly. They, I said, wow, they got abused and they did not get their stimulus uh, uh, money. And so it's a serious issue. I plan to introduce legislation uh, again in the upcoming uh, 2022 uh, legislative session and it will become before your committee so um, I'm glad we're talking about this issue. Yeah. And, uh, Rick uh, coming before your committee uh, chances of bills like this moving forward this year? I, I think uh, always a good chance. Uh, I do want to compliment uh, Senator Faust Cadeau as long as I've been in the Senate and chair of the Judiciary Committee she's been passionate has made outstanding testimony and up to her, we moved the bill forward and got it signed. My concern about this whole thing is that it is so complex. It intertwines with mental illness, drugs, socioeconomic, everything you can mention on the table. We had a similar type of a challenge a few years ago, and we found that we should set up maybe the Criminal Justice Reform Commission. It's more than just an interim, just a two-day hearing. It's something that's been going on now for about two and a half years, 
and we're able to uh, identify specifics, have professional sociologists, professionals come in, give us ideas, compare with other states that have had this issue, what works and what doesn't work. We talk about the 50 state laboratories. Of course, there's some states addressing this, I'm sure, better than we are. So that's what I think we need to do, is form some of a domestic violence uh, commission. It will overlap into sexual predators. I mean, it's, it's bound to. Mm -hmm. It is so complex. But that would be, I think, a long-term solution, rather than just picking this and picking that and hoping it works. That's yeah. And I just want to uh, conclude by saying, you know, I think that uh, the media, I think that the uh, Wichita Police Department, I think that the courts, I think that the legislature, we all really need to look at this issue uh, with urgency. Mm -hmm. It kind of is on the back burner, and uh, but women are dying, as you mentioned, uh, every 42 seconds, did you say, or... I 47.1 excuse they, me that's the that's how frequently uh, arrests are made yes yeah. um and and we know that um it was said to me once that um um when a woman makes that complaint uh that we don't care enough about it because we say that the woman's going to go back to her abuser and that's where we have to step in and help <coughs> and just say on that first time uh maybe not jail time but on that first time we shouldn't just let people go get a um, anger management certificate and mm. then they go back home and it happens over and over. We should yeah. really uh, help to save yeah. lives. Yeah. And I do know that is one thing that uh, advocates are wanting is to change that to a first offense. They wanted that the first time around, weren't able to get it through. And I'm gonna leave you th with a couple of numbers here. We know in 2020, Sedgwick County saw an 8% increase in domestic violence incidents to a record of 8,344 incidents for the year. They'd never recorded that many. That's more than Johnson, Wyandotte, Douglas, Leavenworth, Riley, Butler, Reno, and Salina counties combined. Now, if you're interested in more information on this, you can look at cake.com for the video stories or go to the Kansas Reflector for written stories. I teamed up with Tim Carpenter from the Reflector on this investigation. Moving from domestic violence to neglect, not everyone from Kansas is paying the child support they owe, which is hurting their children and co-parents. Alec Gartner at the KSN Capitol Bureau takes a look at what a new state committee is doing to help. Lawmakers are hearing single parents aren't getting what they deserve, so they're going through the entire collection and dispersing process to see what the problem is. A little bit of a breakdown in the system, and we want to find out where that is at. Katie Wisman shared what her experience is like. She describes an out-of-state deadbeat dad that hasn't been keeping on his end of the deal. An individual who's self-employed and is not responding to any of the attempts to collect on that debt. Um, so I've been caught in the various aspects of the system for over 13 years and the debt that's owed to me is over $53,000. She says the agencies responsible for enforcing payment aren't doing their job and that she's not the only one being affected. Saw an opportunity to share a very personal story um, to really put a face to the failures that exist and um, really expose it not necessarily on behalf of me, but all the other Kansans that struggle with this, the same thing. Lawmakers are looking toward the Department for Children and Families, contractors, a payment center, and the courts to see how areas can be improved. They also say it's critical to make sure national dollars are going to the right place. We want to make sure the percentages of the people that are getting paid out are at that an, a good national level that's making sure that our system is working. Lawmakers on the committee will meet again next month to form recommendations to send to the full legislature on how to improve the system. Reporting at the Capitol, I'm Alec Gartner. And this is a fairly new committee, one of the first meetings. Where does a committee like this go from here, Rick? Well, obviously uh, we have a serious problem and I wasn't aware of how serious it was until you called and said, but this is going to be one of the subjects, so I did do a little reading. And then you just reported to me the numbers in Sedgwick County. It's alarming. The, uh, the problem is multifaceted. There are so many things built into the statute now that requires uh, payments be made, uh, whether it be uh, insurance claims, uh, they, they take out their part for child support. But there's a lot of people out there that are self-employed, unemployed, that are missing, getting missed completely. 
and there's federal dollars coming down, we want to make sure that we're getting our match. And to get our match, we have to have valid numbers so that we can substantiate our request. And uh, it's going to be a real challenge, but it's going to have to get done because obviously we got some gaps in the system. I think Senator McGinn outlined it best. We need to get up to speed and get this fixed. Well, and I've got to say some of the complaints I'm hearing uh, from these parents sounds very similar to some of the other complaints we've heard about uh, from folks dealing with DCF functions that have been contracted out to non-state agencies, Aletha. Oh, absolutely. This is a, uh, another issue that is near and dear to me and I hear about it all the time. Um, you know, I remember when we passed legislation that uh, if you had not paid your child support, right. you couldn't get your fishing license. That's right. Uh, but I think we need to do more than that. Uh, but one problem I think we have is if you have not paid <coughs> your un um, um, child support payment, you know, we put people in jail and then they lose their jobs sometimes. So we have to reevaluate that. Perhaps we could um, have them do community service, but we're gonna have to fix that too. I know here in Cedric County, actually all 105 counties, uh, we only pay $5 an hour for um, uh, uh, community service. And maybe we could up that a little bit to eight bucks, but uh, um, it, what happens is the single mom, she suffers the most, the children suffer the most, and we need to make sure that dads are doing their part. And, you know, they're already absent from the home, and so we need to make sure, and, and as the Senator Carolyn McGann and others on that committee, uh, I know that we talk about this all the time. Recently, uh, on October 5th and 6th, I was in Topeka for the special uh, committee on child welfare, uh, the issues with DCF and the contractors and the whole gamut of it. And I'm just glad now that we have finally, uh, we're looking at every uh, piece of it, mm -hmm. you know, to put it together to do, um, uh, as we say, uh, what's in the best interest of the children. Yeah. Well, you mentioned pay, and pay is becoming a bigger and bigger issue as employers across the state are fighting to fill open positions. We've heard it again and again. They cannot find enough workers. Cakes Jackson Overstreet says at least one business appears to have found a solution. It is the lunch rush at Medi's downtown. Throughout the pandemic, the Mediterranean restaurant has worked hard to stay open. For a while, it was... Uh little tough. We were able to maintain the number of staff that we wanted, but we were having problems getting new staff. Like many restaurant owners in town, Alex Harb is trying to figure out how to recruit new hires. His solution to the problem, bumping pay for current staff and new hires to 20 or $25 an hour. When you work in the restaurant industry, you work when other people play. You have no life. So we really have to offer them something more to get him to come to work. Since Medi started offering the higher pay last month, Harb says it's gotten more than 400 applications. This kind of thinking is something Amanda Duncan with the Wichita Workforce Center says businesses will have to look at to fill the over 7,000 open jobs in the city. Individuals who have a lot of choice will really be evaluating what's best for them. The unemployment rate in Cedric County is just over 5%. Duncan says this makes for a tight labor market with more people hiring than seeking a job. She says that on top of people prioritizing things like pay and working environments much more after COVID means businesses will have to work hard to stand out. Something Harb has noticed as well. I don't think what, the way we used to do things in 2019 works anymore. We have to change with the environment. The environment is changing. We have to change. And it change we must. Dr. Jeremy Hill a couple weeks ago at the annual jobs forecast dinner was saying we have no choice because we're not the only state dealing with a worker shortage and we're because we're actually still paying less in Kansas than in other states. We're losing people, good workers, skilled labor to other states at this point. That that's not a good position to be in. Absolutely. I think, uh, of course, uh, raising the um, uh, the wage 
that's a great incentive. However, I'm talking to people who are still leery. They are afraid to go back to those essential jobs uh, because they don't know who has COVID and who doesn't have it. And certainly they don't want to get sick. However, I think, uh, Pilar, that we're, uh, and Senator, that we're gonna have to start training people to go back. It's a different workforce now. Um, um, more things, we're working more from home. A lot of people lack that um, technical uh, uh, experience and knowledge. Uh, we're gonna have to train people um, to uh, work differently. And uh, I, I think what will help is that we are consistent of what we are asking people to do. I mean, you know, we might do uh, at a workplace here in Central County totally different than we would do in, in McPherson. And so we need to, everybody needs to be a part of um, uh, um, helping this problem and, and helping people to be gainfully employed and add to our tax base. Well, and uh, they, they talked about raising the pay. Uh, Kansas's minimum wage has been stagnant for several years now. Is that perhaps something that's on the plate? Uh, I don't know whether it's on the plate. I think it should be evaluated. But I can tell you in my community, minimum wage at 725 or whatever it is, is not even in the play. McDonald's was paying $15 an hour a year ago. Mm -hmm. So we're way past that. Supply and demand is taking care of that. The only problem with these higher wages, which is wonderful for the worker that's qualified, but there are some businesses where they cannot afford to pay that mm -hmm. and their margins are not there. So they'll either have to close or in rural communities, I'm starting to see, believe it or not, kiosk in McDonald's. So a kiosk would replace a couple yeah. of workers, mm -hmm. then they yeah. can pay the ones that are left more. So it's a complex thing again, if you look at the big picture. But I don't see our minimum wage really having an impact because everybody's way above that now. I've got to say, you know, I, two years ago, I refused to use the self-checkout at grocery stores because I'm like, I'm not going to do, right. do for myself what I'm already paying a premium for somebody else to do. But now, to me, it's kind of different because I know there aren't enough people to do those jobs. It doesn't bother me as much. Mm. That's right. And if they would pay $25 an hour, good for them, mm -hmm. but that goes right into the cost of groceries. And you know, someone pays at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's a balance. Good for that gentleman that's from Medis yeah. that raised and could pass that mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Uh, I commend him. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, as some folks are raising pay, many <coughs> Kansans say they are still struggling to get money they feel the state owes them for pandemic unemployment, or even to answer basic questions as Rebecca Chung of the KSN Capital Bureau shows us. Come here, Rosie. They're my baby. DJ Henderson from Topeka is a family man. He takes his dog out for walks, and as a single parent, he spends his days working construction, trying to provide for his son. But during the pandemic, his life took a major turn when businesses and schools shut down. I was not able to work because of COVID being a single parent and I am dad and mom to my son. He had to stay home to help his son through school, maxing out his 401k and scrambling to find money to make it by, especially through the holiday season. He knew the tough situation we were in and he was happy with what he got. And he gave me the biggest hug on Christmas morning, which I'll never forget. So he applied for federal unemployment benefits and was told he got approved. They said, yeah, you've been approved and they sent me a Bank of America card. It's a card used to receive payments from the department, but no money came. So Henderson tried contacting the department himself. When he finally got in touch with someone, they asked him to send in more documents, and he did. Oh yeah, we got everything. Well, then it went from, we need this now, we need this now. But it was too late. After months of calling and phone conversations, Henderson's documents were sent days past the required time frame to submit. According to the department, that's about two business days. But they say Henderson was denied for being non-responsive to the agency's requests, sending a final email in August. Well, Henderson says he never saw that email or other papers that were sent until we looked into it. Now he's trying to get in touch with someone to figure out what to do next. But he says even that's a struggle, especially now that he's back to work. They hang up on you. And that's frustrating when you're waiting on for, hold for five hours, especially if you have a job and you took off 
to get a hold of somebody. There's a lot of people out there like me that hasn't been paid, and I'd like help from my state and my government to get the people their money that is owed to them. And I've got to say that, uh, you know, the number of people contacting us about problems with unemployment has gone down, but the stories are getting more and more difficult to hear. <clears throat> and, and, and at least from our end, it doesn't seem like there's much we can do in the media. We've tried, but it doesn't seem to go anywhere any more than it does when individuals contact the Department of Labor. What about you guys? Are you having any luck at helping constituents? Uh, yes, I am. And uh, I, my goodness, and the senator, good senator from Sedgwick, I'm sure, has had hundreds of them. I am fortunate enough as vice president of the Senate to have a chief of staff but we ferret out. If these people would just call their state representative, I don't care who they are, most state reps will get into the Department of Labor and get them some help. Now, sometimes the results aren't what they want to hear, but at least we can get through that chokehold and get in there. I've had great success in, in getting resolution at the end of the day, not counting the time delays, it's horrid, but uh, I would say call your representative or your state senator, and I'll guarantee a state senator like Falskado <laughs> would take care of it, and I, we sure take care of it. I got two this morning, matter of fact, mm -hmm. and uh, that's immediately got it right on it and sent it through the channels. Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, uh, um, for um, the uh, confidence. I have it in you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I tell you, uh, <coughs> you know, most mornings, uh, I'm, I start getting calls like I'm a business starting at 8 a.m. And, and I'll literally, if I don't have anything else on my schedule to do, I'll, I'll be on the phone and taking calls uh, from 8 a.m. until uh, noon. Um, and what I'm hearing, the people that I'm hearing from now, the majority of them, they've already filed at one point, mm -hmm. but um, they then fall into uh, that fraud investigation mm -hmm. piece. So then when they get, after they get all their paperwork in, um, then they are being met by um, um, uh, 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 representatives at uh -huh. the Department of Labor that will tell them, you know, let me look into this, or they might put them on hold yep. even, yep. and then they never come back to them. Mm -hmm. So I've been fortunate to be able to um, have a direct contact where I can immediately just take a person's yeah. name, phone number, last four digits of the social. Mm -hmm. I send an email, I yeah. get a response right yeah. away, and then they and get a call if, in and three And I'm gonna days. stop you there because we are out of time. If you don't know who your state lawmaker is, go to kslegislature.org. On the left-hand side of the screen, there's a search function so you can find out who that is. We are out of time for the day. Thank you both, Aletha and Rick, for joining us. For now, stay safe and have a great week.